Evaluating a patient who presents with ataxia is probably one of the most complicated neurodiagnostic algorithms. I don't know, maybe just that relative to other more common neurologic disorders like headache or MS, ataxia is not as familiar to me. And some of the early components to an ataxia evaluation do make perfect sense. You get brain imaging to rule out structural or vascular causes, labs to rule out systemic or nutritional disturbances, and CSF testing to exclude inflammatory ideologies. But after that, I've got to turn to the experts and the literature to know what diagnostic tests carry the greatest yield moving forward. In this week's episode of the Brainwaves podcast, we're skipping over this first tier of diagnostic testing and jumping right into the presentation and the genetic testing of ataxia, with a focus on the autosomal dominant spinocerebellar ataxia type 3, or the Mikado Joseph disease. Stay with us. This week's episode of the Brainwaves podcast and the following message are brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron partners with over 150 farms to give you the highest quality ingredients for your kitchen. Blue Apron works with its farmers to promote sustainable agriculture, generate hormone and antibiotic-free products, and reduce food waste. For $30 off your first order and to explore unique chef-inspired recipes, check out this week's blog entry at brainwaves.me. I'm not sure why I had to preface spinocerebellar ataxia 3 or SCA3 with it being an autosomal dominant condition. All the SCAs are autosomal dominant, and all are neurodegenerative as well. Many can look identical in the clinical setting, and most have similar neuroimaging features, which are nonspecific. So you can imagine that once you've ruled out the acquired causes of ataxia, zeroing in on the genetic cause can be tricky. Today we're going to be talking about, almost exclusively, SCA3 which is the most common spinocerebellar ataxia in the world. And like many of the other SCAs, SCA3 is characterized by a number of non-ataxic features. Beginning with the face and moving down the body, patients with SCA3 may have exophthalmos and eventually develop external ophthalmoplegia. There may be facial and lingual fasciculations, peripheral amyotrophy, and even spasticity or dystonia in the later stages. Patients may also have disturbances during sleep, such as periodic limb movement disorder or restless leg syndrome, which we see in about 55% of patients. And others may have some degree of autonomic dysfunction. With such a spectrum of clinical symptoms, it shouldn't surprise you to learn that SCA3 was described as a distinct entity on three separate occasions in the early 1970s. In the last of the three original descriptions, the authors clearly articulate, quote, this is a new genetic entity, distinct from other autosomal dominant neurologic disorders such as Mikado's disease, which was the same genetic thing. All the families in the original descriptions were of Portuguese origin, and only in 1978 did we realize that each family had the same genotype, only there were different phenotypes. The Mikado family was described as having a later onset ataxia, with an average age of onset of about 47, with distal amyotrophy and external ophthalmoplegia. The Joseph family, who suffered from a much earlier onset of disease, were affected in their mid-twenties by rapidly progressive pyramidal and extrapyramidal symptoms, notably dystonia and ophthalmoplegia. In 1975, no member of the Joseph family had any cerebellar ataxia, which is why this was described as a unique entity. A third family, the Thomases, who, although they were described the same year as the original Mikado family in 1972, Their name was subsequently neglected in the later Mikado-Joseph eponym. The Thomas family was a kind of hybrid of the Mikado and Joseph phenotype. The Thomases had a symptom onset in their late 30s and early 40s, beginning with ataxia and then later developing facial fasciculations, spasticity, and external ophthalmoplegia. As far as genetics go, SCA3 is one of the polyglutamine repeat disorders, the CAG triplet repeats just like SCA1, SCA2, 6, 7, and 17. In SCA3, the triplet repeat mutation occurs on chromosome 14 within the ATXN3 gene. And as with other triplet repeat disorders, the more the repeats, the greater the clinical severity. Ultimately, aggregates of the ATXN3 protein build up inside neurons throughout the central nervous system, and not just in regions like the pons and the midbrain and basal ganglia where there's MRI evidence of atrophy. Ataxin-3 aggregates are found in unrelated brain regions, where maybe you wouldn't expect to find them based on the patient's symptomatology, 
and these aggregates are also found in axon projections within the CNS and in the peripheral nervous system. It's presumed that such a diffuse expression of the dysfunctional ataxin 3 is what contributes to the non-motor and extracerebellar features of the Mikado Joseph disease. Since the initial descriptions of the first three families, several major subgroups of Mikado Joseph have been described, and each reflects the heterogeneity in the clinical symptoms. The variability in the expressivity has a lot to do with the fact that SCA3 is one of the triplet repeat disorders, like we just mentioned. More repeats in these disorders is associated with the phenomenon of anticipation, earlier symptoms, and more aggressive course of the disease with more repeats. Type 1 of SCA3, for example, has the largest number of repeats, and it's seen in patients with earlier onset ataxia, usually in their teens and 20s, with rapid onset of pyramidal symptoms and dystonia. Type 2 is the most common subtype, affecting almost two-thirds of patients with Mikado Joseph disease, and it's characterized by progression of symptoms over years, beginning from age 20 to 50. As many as four and maybe five unique types of SCA3 have been described in the literature, and these only highlight the complexity of the spinocerebellar ataxias and the variable expressivity of the symptoms, despite having the same underlying genetic basis. We've got a few patient photos on our blog that have been published just to show you the age range and the severity of symptoms as they relate to each subtype of the Mikado Joseph disease. So the clinical manifestations can be extremely variable and even unpredictable, so let's get into more detail about that. We already know that these patients don't even have to be ataxic at presentation in order to have this spinocerebellar ataxia. The original Joseph family didn't even have cerebellar ataxia. But many patients will have trunchal ataxia, or scanning speech, or impaired psychotic eye movements, or something like that. And in addition to these motor manifestations of cerebellar dysfunction, patients with SCA3 are at an increased risk of developing a cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. Some experts have called this the Schmamann syndrome. While our understanding of the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome is still in its infancy, We've observed cases of affective disorders ranging from depression to aggression to anxiety and disinhibition, and even obsessive-compulsive behaviors, which can be just as disabling as gait instability in some cases. And these affective problems can be seen in other forms of cerebellar disease, not just SCA3. I already mentioned that central axon dysfunction in patients with SCA3 exists, but these patients also appear to have a peripheral neuropathy as well. As many as 60% of patients will develop this peripheral neuropathy, mostly involving sensory fibers, and sometimes resulting in neuropathic pain. And this is important to recognize because patients with Mikado Joseph have several reasons to complain about pain. In some, a sensory neuropathy can progress from tingling to painful dysesthesias. In other patients, motor neuron involvement can lead to muscle cramping that's treated entirely differently. As the upper motor neurons and the extrapyramidal system degenerates with time, the dystonia can lead to painful spasms and even contractures. And it's really worth knowing all of these pain-causing symptoms in patients with Mikado Joseph disease, because the pain is optimally managed when you address that underlying cause. Patients who have pain due to muscle cramps, for example, will usually improve with carbamazepine or mixilatine, whereas the pain due to spasticity and dystonia could be more responsive to dopaminergic agonists or muscle relaxants. Occasionally, motor nerve involvement can present with foot drop, or fasciculations, which also contributes to a patient's disability. On nerve conduction studies, you can see the signs of axon loss, with widespread reduction in the amplitudes of CMAPs and SNAP responses. On EMG, there will be evidence of acute and chronic denervation, both proximally and distally, which should help you to exclude the potential length-dependent neuropathic processes, like diabetes. Fasciculations and myokymia can also be seen, and of course, autopsy studies have confirmed that there is neuronal loss in the anterior horn of the spinal cord, and that these patients do have degeneration of their dorsal root ganglia. While the motor involvement and the ataxic symptoms may be the most prominent features, experts recommend a thorough screening for dysautonomia as well. Approximately half of patients with SCA3 will have at least one symptom of autonomic dysfunction, whether it's urinary incontinence, cold intolerance, or it's a disturbance in the sweat gland function and these are the most common three. Orthostatic hypotension is far less common, and when you see this in a patient without a strong family history of ataxia, it might make you think of one of the other Parkinson plus syndromes, like multiple systems atrophy or corticobasal ganglionic degeneration. <laughs> 
Now, why am I telling you all this? Who really needs to know this level of detail regarding a single rare disease? What's worth knowing here is that the spinocerebellar ataxias, the SCAs, as a whole are not purely disorders of impaired coordination or movement. Thinking about SCA3 as an example, these syndromes are characterized by an incredibly broad range of symptoms. Often, you'll see a patient who has a strong family history of abnormal movements or gait disturbance, and maybe you'll see that they have truncal instability or a little bit of dystonia, and that's not going to nail any diagnosis for you but it might cause you to strongly suspect one of the SCAs. It's still important to do your due diligence, knowing that none of the SCAs are curable, and you should rule out the treatable and reversible causes, the vitamin E deficiency, the toxic causes, and any structural abnormalities of the brain that could be clouding the picture. We've put a brief list of these differential diagnoses on our blog for your review. And once these treatable causes are excluded, then you can proceed down this genetic testing pathway with much greater certainty. And often this remains referring to a specialist who works solely in making genetic diagnoses, which is totally fine, and you're not admitting defeat by doing this. The field of genetics is evolving rapidly, and I know I'm not able to keep up with it. And if I didn't know any better, and I saw a patient who I suspected of having a SCA in my clinic, I might have just sent them for whole exome sequencing to rule out other heritable causes of ataxia. But the whole exome sequencing won't even confirm Mikado Joseph disease, much less any of the other triplet repeat SCAs. Sequencing the exome is useful in identifying potential pathogenic variants of known genes, like insertions or deletions, that may ultimately alter a final protein product. But when it comes to triplet repeat disorders, there's no insertion or deletion in the gene. The gene just happens to have more of the same amino acids in its final product. So the whole exome is going to miss that pathogenic triplet repeat, and instead it may actually catch a few variants of unknown significance that aren't likely contributing to the clinical picture. In cases where a patient presents with a late onset ataxia, or a weak family history of ataxia, and there's no clear inheritance pattern, experts believe that that's when you should consider whole exoming. Because this scenario would not be typical of a SCA, or of Friedrich's ataxia, or of some mitochondrial disease. A point mutation, or a pathogenic variant, is much more likely there. In the adult onset cases of ataxia that I've seen, and there really haven't been many, I've referred those patients to neurogenetics, and they all ended up having SCAs, which were diagnosed using a very targeted SCA panel. And although there's no cure of Mikado Joseph disease, much less a cure for any of the other spinocerebellar ataxias, for patients, there is some solace in knowing your condition, and knowing the pattern of inheritance and the risk of transmission to your children. If not for personal prognostication, then at least it can be helpful for family planning. And that's about all I know when it comes to medical genetics and SCA3. Hopefully it made a little sense to you. That's all we got for our show this week. And as we get deeper into the spring, remember that for those of you who are taking your board exams this year, or if you're recertifying, the Penn Neurology Board Review course is an incredible resource. And you can get a $150 discount if you sign up using our promo code WAVES2018. That's WAVES in all caps. There's a link to this registration on our blog at brainwaves.me. And if you haven't taken a second to rate our show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, please do this. The Brainwaves podcast is produced out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Jim Siegler, senior producer. Music this week was courtesy of Ian Sutherland, Mike Durek, and Androzik. For more information on what we discussed, please enjoy the content on our blog at brainwaves.me. I'm Jim Siegler, and thanks for listening. <laughs>